A History of Laurent, Part 3, Expo 67. It's March 1960, and the city of Montreal anxiously awaits the announcement by the Bureau International de Exposition of its chosen host city for the 1967 World's Expo. From its early days in the mid-18th century, with the London and Paris events, international expositions had become a significant event, rendering any host city into a globally recognized leader in industry and modernism. As the announcement came, Montreal had already submitted two failed attempts to host the event and were favored on being third time lucky to finally be announced as host. Then the unexpected happened. Moscow was announced as the winning bid for the 1967 World's Fair. Montreal once again had to sit in resignation on its third failed attempt to host an event it so desired, compounded with the fact that this time they had lost to only one vote. October 16, 1962, Russian First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev agrees to Fidel Castro's request to install nuclear weapons on the island of Cuba, an action that quickly snowballed into the Cuban Missile Crisis, a conflict between the United States and Russia that escalated to possible nuclear war that was the most turbulent period of relations between the two. In the couple years since the World Exposition had been granted to the USSR, global sentiment towards the nation had reached an all-time low and the Russian government, in response to this and rising financial concerns due to sanctions from the conflict, was forced to pull out of the obligation to host the event, due to be held in less than five years' time. The BIE quickly made the decision to award the event to the next qualified bidder, and in a public announcement to the city he held dear, Montreal Mayor Jean Drapeau announced that at last, they would get their World Expo. The only problem being, they had a third less time than other host cities to prepare for it, along with no physical location chosen to stage the larger-than-life event. Numerous sites for the exposition were proposed, from Pont Saint-Charles, Anjou, Maison Neuve Park, Mercier, along with the mountain that gave the city its name, were all considered for the five square kilometers of space required to host the event. With land appropriation, infrastructure and environmental issues all making the project more daunting, along with exorbitant compensation terms and costs, there was no easy solution for the basic problem of where the exposition could take place. The answer had to be feasible and painless to allow for construction to start right away. Jean Drapeau had a radical idea of his own, one that assembled many detractors purely from disbelief. To build the exposition on its own set of islands, directly in the middle of the St. Lawrence River, east of the city. Ile saint Helene is a natural island in the St. Lawrence that features a historic fort while also serving as a central base for the river-spanning Jacques Cartier Bridge. Drapeau's proposal was for this island to be expanded with landfill from the already under construction Montreal Metro subway project. This would not prove to be sufficient as the project got underway and fill from local quarries and other sources was needed to meet the demand of the vast area of lands required as the base for the exposition. This would also be the first World's Exposition to have the abbreviated name of Expo. It was on August 12, 1963, that construction was inaugurated. A press conference and ceremony heralds the start of the project. Key figures in the early phase of its development attended, including Drapeau and Commission General Paul Bienvenu. The latter resigned only 10 days after the inauguration ceremony, where from several barges along the river, dignitaries unloaded the first few tons of fill into the St. Lawrence. There was much to bother Bievenu in his federally appointed post. Backlash from numerous levels of government involved in funding the project objected to its cost and scale. In fact, his original appointee, then Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, was by then no longer in control of the government, having lost the most recent election to Liberal Lester Pearson, long critical of the Expo project. But possibly the most straining on Bievenu 
was a computer analysis used to predict the completion date of the project, October 1969. Despite the underlying problems of the Gargantuan project, a new commissioner, Pierre Dupuis, was put in place. Along with Anglophone Robert F. Shaw, the two men signaled the underlying importance of having both cultural identities represented to lead the project forward. Dupuis with the French-Canadian flair and Shaw with the Anglo determination and grit. It proved to be a successful combo. Shaw set forth to expand his team of administrators and was on record as looking for a few crazy French people to add to his team to put together the project in a little over the four years that they had left to construct it. This team came to be known as Les Deux, the hard men. Dupuis himself would travel the world, visiting every country that expressed an interest in participating in Expo 67, an invitation that would involve each to construct their own unique pavilion for the display of their country's culture and products. Yves Jasmin, as Director of Information, Director of Advertising, and Director of Public Relations, was put in charge of all media aspects for Expo 67, chief among them being to attract Americans to the event. After Dupuis had officially welcomed the USSR, signing an agreement on a Russian warship anchored in the St. Lawrence in Montreal, Jasmin ran an ad in Life magazine, announcing to Americans that Russia was building something only 40 miles from the American border, something they should be very curious to see. The rivalry was also more localized, as Toronto, long at odds with Montreal, over which city was to be considered the central metropolis of the country, criticized the Expo project and the amount of public funds being used to produce the event. The Canadian National Exhibition was a chief detractor, seeing Expo as a threat to the success of their long-running yearly summer's end event. It would prove to be an obsession that resulted in the CNE creating their own imitation Expo, Ontario Place, four years after Expo 67. There were numerous other criticisms and moves to stall or all-out end Expo 67, most notably towards its overall theme and logo, Man and His World, meant to signal a unifying presence of international communities joined together in a primitive representation of man. Many citizens, and even the Canadian Parliament itself, criticized the theme and resultant logo as not representative of Canada enough. But the leaders of Expo pushed on. Even more problematic was the overall budget of the project, which at first had not been prepared. Originally proposed to cost 167,000 Canadian dollars, once the final plans were set, the cost had ballooned to near three times that amount. In current dollars, the project would cost near two billion and had to seek the approval of the federal government once more, a government still led by Expo skeptic Lester Pearson. In a deja vu moment from the initial BIE awarding vote, the new budget passed a federal review by one vote. Expo would go ahead, once again by the narrowest of odds. With the site on the St. Lawrence still only a few landforms and appearing nowhere near ready for the actual construction to begin, another hard man was brought in to see the construction phase through. His name was Colonel Churchill. With 12 bridges, 847 buildings, and three transit systems required to be ready in less than four years, Churchill deployed the critical path method an approach used to develop the atomic bomb. All areas were aligned to meet the intended target of opening day in April of 1967. The feat seemed impossible, especially to those that at the time only saw the slowly emerging islands. Despite this, construction went ahead at a furious pace. Ile saint helene was divided into two sections, and the northernmost point was to be reserved for a dedicated amusement area for visitors that would entertain them with rides, restaurants and shows into the late hours till 2.30 a.m. This area was to be named La Ronde. The building phase lasted a little over a year before the projected opening date. Many skeptics felt that the goal would never be achieved. But on April 27, 1967, to an invitation-only audience including 53 heads of state and 7,000 media, Expo 67 opened despite all odds.
while most of the over 50 million visitors that would stream through its gates the following day and months beyond came to the site for the exposition itself, many would come to enjoy the amusements offered at La Ronde. The park offered a wide assortment of state-of-the-art midway rides from the era, along with numerous themed attractions including a pirate ship at its central lake, a Swiss mountain village at its second east-facing entrance, a gondola ride that traveled over the lake itself, where throughout the day water sports shows would entertain large crowds. The Fort Edmonton central section of the park featured a saloon with daily cabaret shows, numerous cuisine options from around Canada, and even a barber shop. A monorail snaked its way throughout the park with several stations. La Platoon, an aerodynamics log flume ride, would soak and delight riders for many decades to come. La Journée de Mille Pat, one of Aero's early tubular steel roller coasters, entertained families in the children's area. But the chief attraction of them all was the Gyrotron. Housed in a mysterious pyramid-shaped building, where guests would travel into space and into the depths of Earth itself on a leisurely paced conveyor transport system. Another triangle on the site, a uniquely shaped theater, the Jardin des Etoiles, entertained guests throughout the expo event with various performers. The Expo Express rapid transit system, purposely built for the event, terminated at La Ronde, allowing guests to bypass the entire event and disembark right at the park's grounds. Its station was originally located above the park's main gates. To the east of these gates was the purpose-built Alcan Aquarium, where inside a daily program included dolphin and sea lion shows. By the park's rear entrance was also a safari featuring numerous animals that guests could ride and also observe from a jeep safari. La Spiral, a rotating observation platform ascended guests high above the park for panoramic views of La Ronde. At its base was the Cal Four, a miniaturized expo featuring souvenirs and food from locations around the world. After nearly six months of visitors beyond the belief of the organizers, featuring countless celebrities and heads of state, royalty, and even a couple dozen protests and assassination attempts, Expo 67 ended on October 29, 1967. While the official exposition was then closed and most of the pavilion's exhibits returned to their country's owners, the expo itself continued on as Man in His World, opening each summer to entertain guests wishing to tour watered-down versions of the exposition. Laurent, however, would continue to run as a full-time amusement park, owned and run by the city of Montreal. The city's first official theme park had come to life, born out of one of the world's great public events, but its future would not carry on in the illustrious manner as it enjoyed during Expo 67. In fact, much of the vision of Laurent would suffer in its ensuing years as a lack of consistency in how the park should evolve led to a slow depreciation of many of its original attractions and themed areas. Laurent, much like the temporary edifice of Expo 67, had to change in some way after its successful beginnings. A park soon unsure of itself would see numerous transformations in a very short time.